the next video lecture and here we're going to discuss longer term control of blood pressure which means not instantly this is minutes to longer than minutes this largely occurs through renal regulation renal refers to the uh, kidneys <clears throat> well one thing I don't think I actually mentioned on the last video lecture those baroreceptors that are located in the aortic arch the carotid sinuses and some of the other large arteries up in the um, upper part of the body um, unfortunately those adapt pretty quickly to chronic high or low blood pressure which means longer term if your blood pressure is high too high or too low the baroreceptors quit responding to those types of things and so that's how you can wind up on a longer term basis having high blood pressure because your baroreceptors uh, you know if your your blood pressure is constantly at 150 over 95 pretty soon your baroreceptors adapt to that and they quit sending signals up to the cardiovascular centers and the medulla um, about that higher blood pressure. Okay, so longer term mechanisms for controlling blood pressure, which unfortunately don't always work as many people develop higher blood pressure as we get older. Um, most of these work by altering blood volume. So again, to review the th three things that control blood pressure or influence blood pressure, cardiac output, peripheral resistance, and altering blood volume. So for longer term blood pressure control, this altering blood volume winds up being uh, the most critical. <clears throat> the kidneys do this uh, through two major mechanisms. One is called the direct renal mechanism. The kidneys filter plasma out of the blood um, and into the urine that is forming in the kidneys before it makes its way down to the bladder. So the kidneys are able to uh, respond by limiting the amount of plasma that gets squeezed out into the early urine and that can influence blood pressure by controlling blood volume. Or there's an indirect mechanism which involves a series of hormones and this is called the renin angiotensin aldosterone mechanism or system and we learned about aldosterone when we covered the uh, uh, the endocrine system at the beginning of the course this is a hormone which when it's around uh, causes more sodium to be retained out of the urine that's forming in the kidneys it causes sodium ions to be reabsorbed back into our body fluids water follows so that's going to increase your blood volume, increases your blood pressure. We've heard that story before. Now, we didn't talk about this whole mechanism, though, because I mentioned at that time we would talk about it when we did the cardiovascular system. So we will talk about it here. All right, this is a diagram from your uh, textbook, which is showing what goes on in the kidney. So over here on the left, this is depicting the direct renal mechanism which is used by your uh, kidney so if arterial pressure is down your blood pressure is lower the kidney sense that this is occurring and so you have reduced filtration filtration is referring to uh, blood plasma being squeezed out and convert it over to urine in the kidneys. If your blood pressure is low, the kidneys will squeeze out less blood plasma. You'll keep more of the plasma in the blood and you'll make less urine. So you have decreased urine formation. That will help you maintain blood volume. That'll keep your blood volume higher and that will help raise or help you maintain mean arterial pressure, that MAP that's gonna help you maintain your blood pressure. Okay, the indirect renal mechanism involves uh, the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, which we see depicted here on this diagram on the right. <clears throat> okay, so we already know that uh, a decrease in blood pressure inhibits those baroreceptors that we've talked about before. That results in increased sympathetic nervous system activity the sympathetic nervous system 
start sending impulses to help us increase our blood pressure. And um, that helps trigger, there's some other things as well that we'll uh, discuss when we study the kidneys in more detail at the end of the semester. But that triggers the kidneys. There are certain cells in the kidneys that make a protein called renin. Okay, renin is an enzyme. Okay, when the kidneys secrete renin into the bloodstream, renin, there is a protein in your bloodstream called angiotensinogen. And angiotensinogen is an inactive form of a hormone called angiotensin. This is kind of like when we were studying the procoagulants, the uh, inactive forms of your clotting factors and how they have to get converted into the active form. Same kind of deal here. You always have floating around in your blood an inactive hormone called angiotensinogen or you could call it a pro-hormone because it's before the active form of the hormone. Pro means before a lot of times in biology. So what renin does, renin converts angiotensinogen into angiotensin. Angiotensin 1, I'm sorry, angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1. All right, angiotensin 1 is still not the active form of angiotensin. Uh, there is an enzyme in the blood called ACE and A stands for angiotensin converting enzyme. But what ACE does, ACE takes angiotensin 1 and converts it over to angiotensin 2. And by converting, what we're talking about is, uh, remember how with the, uh, the inactive forms of the clotting factors, portion gets clipped off and now it's active. Uh, same deal here, but it takes two steps. Renin has to convert angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1. And then this other enzyme called ACE, or angiotensin converting enzyme, takes angiotensin 1 and converts it over to angiotensin 2. So you've got two steps that have to take place. Now angiotensin 2 is a very powerful hormone. It has several diff does several different things that uh, winds up helping us increase our blood pressure. Now one of those things over here on the left, let me erase all this stuff. Once you have this around, angiotensin 2, one of its targets is the adrenal cortex. It stimulates um, the cells in the zona glomerulosa of the adrenal cortex to secrete aldosterone. And we've already learned that aldosterone increases sodium levels in the blood and other body fluids. And that increases water levels increases your blood uh, increases your blood volume which then increases your blood pressure all right so that's just the aldosterone story we learned back in unit one it's just here we are uh, learning more about the story what it takes to actually cause the adrenal cortex to secrete that aldosterone hormone all right another thing that angiotensin 2 does it actually helps trigger uh, the posterior pituitary to secrete ADH. Now when we study the endocrine system we learned that there are receptors in the hypothalamus that detect well solute concentrations are going up so we must be getting dehydrated here we better secrete ADH so that we uh, hold on to more water from the kidneys keep that in the bloodstream and other body fluids and that'll help um, dilute out the solutes that'll help increase our blood volume but um, angiotensin 2 also helps stimulate increased ADH release so um, that's going to help us hold on to more water we're going to reabsorb water uh, back out of the kidneys where urine is being formed and back into the bloodstream and our other body fluids that will increase blood volume that'll increase blood pressure. Another thing that angiotensin 2 does is it stimulates your thirst 
uh, response that's triggered by the hypothalamus. So you feel thirsty, you drink more water, you absorb that water through your intestinal tract, that increases your blood volume and increases your blood pressure. And then finally, a fourth thing that angiotensin II does, this is like a magic hormone, <laughs> it does lots of different things, has several different targets. It actually helps directly stimulate vasoconstriction. So that increases your peripheral resistance and that increases your blood pressure. Incidentally, you guys may hear about people or you may have patients in the future who take ACE inhibitors. That is a type of drug that can help lower your blood pressure. Okay, so what these drugs do is they inhibit ACE or reduce the activity of ACE. And so by doing that, if you inhibit ACE, you don't make as much angiotensin II, so you don't have all this stuff going on. And you don't knock it completely out. It just reduces the activity of ACE, so you don't have as much angiotensin II, and so you have a reduction in these effects. And that can, that's one of the things that can help you control your blood pressure. Okay. Let's see. I think the next couple of slides are just going to provide you some text, which is displaying what I have already describing here, my uh, dachshunds barking in the background. They've actually been pretty good while I've been recording so many of these video lectures at home. Functions of angiotensin too, it's just providing some text for you um, about things I've already covered on the other diagram. All right, I like figure 1911 a lot in your textbook because this is more or less putting um, everything we've talked about together uh, as far as both short-term and long-term things that increase blood pressure, help you in control your blood pressure. So everything on here is leading to an increase in blood pressure. So things over on the left are things that lead to an increased cardiac output. Things over here on the right are the various things we've talked about that can lead to increased peripheral resistance. Um, so I, I want you to, uh, I'm not going to go through this whole diagram. It would probably take me an hour to go through everything that's on here and review. We've covered everything that's on here in bits, as piece, in bits and pieces, uh, both at the end of Unit 2 and then here in Unit 3. But so go through this diagram though and make sure that you understand it because these are the um, stimuli up at the top that lead to an increase in blood pressure down here at the bottom. And so or all those are factors in pink up at the top that ultimately can lead to an increase in blood pressure. Um, so go through this and just make sure that you can follow the stories here and this is a really good diagram that will help you prepare for uh, exam questions. Be careful about some of them. For example, let me point out a couple of things over here. Over here on the left hand side, notice if you have fluid loss from a hemorrhage or excessive sweating, like you've gotten really uh, dehydrated, that's going to reduce your blood volume and it's going to lower your blood pressure when that happens. Okay, um, if your blood pre volume is down, your blood pressure is down, the kidneys are going to respond. Remember your kidneys, you have that direct renal mechanism. Um, so the kidneys are going to stop filtering out as much fluid. So you'll hang on to more blood volume. You'll hang on to more water and fluid in the blood. That's going to help you raise your um, blood pressure. Also, the kidneys, you're going to have conservation of sodium ions due to aldosterone. Um, ADH is going to trigger more water retention from the kidneys into the blood and, and the body fluids. Those things are going to help you increase your blood volume. Um, that's going to lead to an increase in venous return or venous return. That's the amount of blood that is returning to the right side of the heart from the systemic circulation that's going to flow from the right atrium down into the right ventricle um, 
Remember the Frank Starling law of the heart that's going to cause the cardiac muscle fibers to be stretched a little bit more and that causes them to contract with more force. So that increases your stroke volume, that increases your cardiac output, and that helps raise your uh, mean arterial pressure. Okay, and then over here on the um, other side, remember how I mentioned that having a slightly lower blood volume, you're getting a little bit dehydrated, um, will increase your hematocrit, it increases your blood viscosity, so you have a greater concentration of red, red, red blood cells, and if your blood is thicker, that increases your peripheral resistance which increases your blood pressure as well. So kind of be careful with some things on the diagram because like I was talking about in an earlier lecture, a little bit of dehydration directly raises your blood pressure because it increases your peripheral resistance. If you have fluid loss through hemorrhaging, that actually lowers your blood pressure because of that loss in blood volume and then your body goes through a series of responses to help you raise your blood pressure. So, you know, be sure you're following along with the causes and effects that you see here on the, uh, on the diagram. All right, so for uh, the next lecture, we're actually going to talk a little bit more about how you measure and monitor blood pressure. You guys who are going into nursing, of course, are going to learn a whole lot more about that in your nursing classes, but we will uh, introduce some of that, that information in the ninth lecture for Chapter 19.